um, I'll, I'll start with a few announcements. And the first one is that I think today or a few days ago, the UNICEF Hidden in Plain Sight um, statistical analysis of violence against children has come out, and there are copies of the report outside. Um, and uh, I've, I've looked through it in the, through the electronic version, and it's really important and interesting. So, so it kind of adds weight to the statistical evidence that would be the basis for any kind of like future reductions. The second announcement that I would like to make, I just try to remember which ones I have to make, um, is you, some of you noticed that there were some glitches in the summaries of the thematic sessions. And we've put together a new document and it's available online and you can access it from today on the conference website. And the third announcement is that the bursary scholars, I would like to ask them to stay here after the end of this session because there will be, they will be kept for eternity. So that we will... <laughs> Um, uh, so, so, so we will take a photograph uh, of them. So I think that's all the announcements that I had to make. And now I move over to the wizardry. Good. So what I will be trying to do today is um, to combine a number of things that I'm working on um, at, at different levels and, and, and try to share some thoughts with you about reducing homicide by 50% in the coming 30 years. Um, I shall start with saying um, if criminologists say something about crime trends, don't trust them. <laughs> They get it wrong. And, and, and there is a good empirical evidence for this, and I will shortly show, briefly show this to you. So um, one of the things that I, well, I'll, I'll start with, this is the trend in homicide rates in the United States between 1950 and 1995. And in 1995, you can see that homicide keeps going up, and American criminologists were quite convinced that this... Ah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so what's happening to the slides? <laughs> well, I'm pressing next. I can see everything. <laughs> ah. Now who's the wizard? <laughs> <laughs> Good, excellent. So here you can see it. So that's, that, that's homicide in the United States and it was relatively low until 1961 and then it kept going up. And in 1995 there was a shared mood amongst American criminologists that this was just the beginning of things getting even worse. Uh, there was one uh, well-known criminologist, John DiIulio, who coined the phrase of super predators um, coming. And, and, and he was very effective in publicizing this idea that, for instance, kids have absolutely no respect for human life and no sense of the future. These are stone-cold predators. And the projection was that crime, homicide, would keep going up. And this is not what happened. Uh, you can see that they were completely wrong and it started going down and it's kept going down since then. And when you look at this graph, one of the things that are just stunning, and this is, this is genuine wizardry. So, so here is the United States and now we move 7,000 miles to Australia. That's the homicide trend in Australia. And it looks very similar. Now we move another, that's I think about 10,000 miles to Sweden. That's the homicide trend in Sweden. 
And now let's go to, because I come from Switzerland, I can't help showing you Switzerland. This is Switzerland. By the way, in Switzerland, there was also bad criminologists who got things wrong. Um, I wrote a book in 1997, <laughs> The End of the Civilized City. Uh, I had a question mark at the end of the title, but it just shows you that people were just utterly wrong. Now, um, I want to add all Western um, societies. So that's 22 countries, um, and that's the shared trend amongst 22 countries in the Western world. And what you should be able to see here is there is a lot of similarity. If we try to estimate this, about 60% of the variation is shared between these countries. Which raises, first of all, interesting questions. What's going on there? Why are they moving along such a similar trajectory over time? The second thing that I think that you should be able to see here, so they're all standardized to a mean of 100, so the United States. This is done just so to make sure that the United States don't stick out too much, because if, <laughs> if we didn't do this, you know, they would be far above all the others. Um, but the trend is very similar. But you can see from these data that this was a reduction, depending on the country, of between 70 and 50 percent. So within a period of about 20 years, Europe, the Western world reduced homicide rates by about 50 percent. That's far, much faster than what we are trying to achieve at a global level. So I'll, I'll just try to briefly summarize the first few messages. Um, first of all, homicide declines happen. We just saw this. And often they happen at a faster pace than what we're trying to achieve at a global level. This doesn't mean that we can achieve it, but we could. And that's good to have historical evidence suggesting, well, in the not too distant past, these kind of things have happened. Um, they tend to come in bundles. And I think that's important to think about what, this, what does this mean for prevention science? That these things seem to be happening in different places at the same time. Because bear in mind, if we try to push for an agenda of a global homicide decline, we are talking about population level trends. So what we need to understand is what drives these population level trends. We are abysmal at predicting them. In fact, we are utterly useless. And we have no clue what's going to happen next year or two years' time. Um, we are also really bad at retrospectively explaining them. I'm part of the, uh, we have a panel with the American Academy of Sciences on explaining crime trends. And we have about as many explanations of crime trends as we have observation points. So we have no degrees of freedom left. We have everything that we can possibly have. So some of them are more plausible and some of them are less plausible. But we are not really very good at understanding why it's going up and why it's going down. And finally, if we want to make them happen, we really need to understand what drives them. Um, because I'm convinced that this is tr trying to understand things at a different level from trying to understand why one randomized control trial works and another randomized control trial doesn't work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where variation in homicide rates comes from. And I got used to using a scale which is essentially a log, an exponential scale that goes from 0.1 homicides per 100,000 people to 1,000 homicides per 100,000 people. So that's a scale that shows variation by a factor of 1 to 10,000. And that's roughly the amount of variation that you find between human societies. You find this amount of variation over time. You find it between present-day societies. I just mention this because when we looked at Rachel's presentation this morning, one of the really interesting things, and I find this light slightly concerning with these data on, was it domestic violence? That there is so little variation between societies. When it comes to homicide, the evidence is very strong that there is a lot of variation at least by a factor of 100 between societies, but I will show you in a few minutes, between modern societies it's about a factor of 1 to 500. When we look at this variation in homicide rates, one of the things that is important to bear in mind that we are not looking at just 
more or less of the same kind. And the way I, th I tend to think about this is to say that in societies that are pacified, where homicide is very rare, we tend to have a large proportion of female victims. Individual pathologies tend to dominate. It's primarily committed by marginal groups. Homicide is something, is a pathology. And individual level explanations are very useful to understand this. When you look at high homicide societies, homicide becomes politics. It's part of an instrumental behavior. It's primarily male-to-male -male fights. It's organized, sometimes sectarian. And you have violent entrepreneurs. You have organizations that use violence to achieve goals. That can be gangs. That can be other kinds of organizations. You know, in, in England, you have all these beautiful castles. Why do they have them? They're all violent entrepreneurs. That's what they do. Um, so, so this is important to bear in mind, this level of variation. So the next thing that I have done is to give you on this scale an estimate of where we currently stand. And if we divide the roughly 430,000 deaths per year estimated according to the UNODC report, we arrive at an estimated homicide rate globally of about 6.4 per 100,000. And what we would be trying to achieve, if we want to achieve a reduction by 50%, of course, course, we would be arriving at a level of about 3.2. One of the things that this does is to show you that within the variation of homicide rates between societies, this is not a really big step. You know, it's kind of like going down a little, but it's not a massive step. So the next thing that I want to do is to plot all countries with a population of over 1 million on this scale. And that's what this graph show, shows you. So what this shows you is that there is a lot of variation. Singapore is at the very bottom with a homicide rate of about 0.3 per 100,000. And uh, oh, you can see this here. And Honduras is at the top with about 80 per 100,000. So that's variation of a factor of 1, 1 to 300, roughly. This variation is systematically associated with a number of characteristics. And I've only chosen those that I'm interested in. So this is not, um, so, so this is kind of like the cherry picking exercise. There are other factors um, that are also interesting. But I focused on structural and political factors. And I want to read them out to you. So low human development index is associated with homicide rates, a high level of ethnic fractionalization, high level of inequality, a very powerful, um, very robust um, correlate, um, you can control for all kinds of things and it doesn't go away. High levels of corruption is an important predictor. Low democracy, low level of good governance. So societies with high levels of homicide have poor governance, go poor governments. Um, low expenditure on social policy and health. A low level of social trust, as measured, for instance, by the World Value Survey, and a low level of legitimacy of the political system. So what you can see here, that's the main purpose. There is a set of structural variables like social inequality and so on. But one of the things that I want to emphasize here is that there is now robust evidence for a number of characteristics of the political system, the way the state functions is very strongly associated with levels of homicide. I don't know whether that's also true for other types of violence. I would expect that this is also true for other types of violence, but I don't know. But for homicide, the evidence is very robust. So one of the things that we need to bear in mind if we want to reduce global levels of violence is the extent to which homicides are concentrated geographically. 10% of the world population, that's the, just the countries with a rate of 20 plus, 20% 20 of the world population live in countries where 45% of all homicides occur. And the other interesting thing is, if you think about achieving this reduction globally, we can think about it in a way, well, do we need completely new technologies? Do we need new, I'm not against new evidence-based programs, but what I want to say is, 
Well, if you think about a reduction to about 3.2 per 100,000, what proportion of the global population already lives in societies that are below the required level um, in 2040? Well, the answer is 45% of the world population already live in societies with levels of homicide lower than 3.2, and that accounts for about only 9% of all homicides. The basic message here is, if you want to bring homicide levels down, you need to focus on those countries up there. And that's where the resources would have to go. One way of showing this, and I now know I've, I've, I've asked Joe, uh, so, so, so those of you who were in this meeting with Joe have already seen these slides, um, but I, I thought they were worth showing. So this is the world map by levels of homicide. It's roughly inversely proportionate to obesity. So the countries that have low levels of obesity are fat, and the countries with high levels of obesity are slim. And what I shall want to show you in conjunction with this is the map of the world by scientific output. Now what this does is to show you the amount of discrepancy between where homicides occur. This is not specifically criminological output. But I'm sure this would also be true if you look at any kind of prevention programs, any kind of academic output related to problems related to violence. And that obviously brings down the message that we need to contribute to capacity building in these countries that are very slim uh, on this scale. I want to go back to the original scale and show you two regions in the world and where they are located on this scale. This is Western Europe, and you can see that all countries in Western Europe are way below the required average level of about 3.2. And you can also see that almost all countries in Latin America, with a few exceptions, um, I, I'm not sure now whether Uruguay is amongst them, but Chile certainly is, are, is, is below the current level, but all the others are above the current level. So for a historian, one interesting question is, well, how did Europe get there? And that's um, one of the things that I've been doing work on. So what I want to show you is, so now at the bottom you see a scale in years. So this goes back to 1400. So that's the last 600 years of European history. And over the years I've put together some data on levels of homicide in a number of societies. This is seven different regions in Europe, including England, the Benelux, um, the Netherlands, um, Germany, Italy is the one that comes relatively late. And you can see, I mean, I, I, whenever I sh show this, I, I think that this was not my magic unless I've manipulated the data, but I've, I've, I've tried not to. But if you think about this, I mean, if you, if, if you just think about this graph, so along a log linear scale, this just keeps going down over such a long period of time. What's happened? And I won't go into the question what's happened. The important message here is Europe wasn't naturally there from the beginning. So if you are low on these levels, this is a story, a history that happens to a whole society. And I want to add that this is not just something that happens in Europe. I want to just show you three examples of other societies where similar trends have happened. Together with Sara, we put together some data on homicide rates in Chile, which was very high around 1900, and it's gone down. So Chile is not low in comparison of Latin American countries because it always was, but because it went there over time. So if you think about the life course, this is not the life course of an individual, this is the life course of a country. Somehow it got there. Um, Singapore, now the lowest level in the world, some people have speculated that this is because of some kind of culture of, of the East. That's not true. Uh, it, was, uh, it was actually quite high uh, around um, the 1890s and has declined. And here I show you New Zealand. So, so these things have happened across the world. It hasn't happened everywhere. And the case I'm making is not, by the way, that this has happened across the world in a similar way. There are many places where homicide has gone up and keeps going up, but the case is simply to say that we need to understand why these declines are happening. At the moment, 
we live in a period when these declines seem to be pretty widespread. So in preparation for this conference, I've put together data on homicide rates in about 90 countries in the 19, 1995, so I averaged five years, and between 2008 and 2012. So on the next slide, I show you the map of the world, and green means decline, and red means increase. And I found this quite astonishing. So in over 70% of all countries in the world, at least official statistics suggest that homicide has been going down, going down over the last 15 years. This does not mean that it will keep going down, and it may be just a coincidence, but what this means is that we seem to be right now in a period when this is pretty widespread, with some exceptions, and you see that all the major exceptions of increasing homicide are concentrated in Central America, and some of them are uh, further down in South America, um, and Uruguay is one of the countries that has, an increase, has had an increase over the last few years. So let me move on to what drives homicide down. And I want to make three arguments. One is, uh, believe, so this is, you have, just have to believe me, I, I, I'm not going to show you any evidence for it. Um, so one of the factors that I believe was involved in these homicide declines was better governance and the creation of what we call civil society. One of the important thing is, things is that you need to control protection entrepreneurs. If the state doesn't do the control, somebody else will do the control. And it's important for a state to gain control over others who make a business out of using violence. Enforcing the rule of law and compliance with authorities. Developing for state officials something like a civil service ethos. Um, developing something like a sense of legitimacy or fairness of a social order and deliver what is called inclusive state services. So not being particularistic about state services, but trying to be inclusive with these state services. A second element that I want to emphasize, especially for the last 20, 30 years, and, and David Finkelhor, for instance, has written about this or shared thoughts uh, with me about this, and I think this is really important, and, 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 and he presented these thoughts also this morning, and I think they're really important, that certainly for the last period of decline, it's very important to bear in mind that there was a bundle of social control technologies that had probably an effect on homicide rates. Certainly that would be in line with Previous periods of decline of homicide rates, just one example because I like it. If you think that, for instance, antisocial behavior orders for people who are really problematic in their behavior are new invention, evidence based, in 1453, Friedrich, I don't know whether Friedrich, 1453 in Nuremberg, they had a legislation that people who were domestic abusers were no longer admitted to taverns to reduce alcohol consumption. So they understood what was happening and they tried to control this. So that's uh, a, third a second element, and the third element is morality and self-control. So whenever you look at these declines, you have some kind of coalitions of moral entrepreneurs uh, who promote health, child development, civility, self-control, respect, morality. That's essentially us. Um, so, so I think these are three core elements that come together when, in periods when societies experience long-term homicide declines. And now let me go to the future. Well, before I go to the future, I want to say something about a research agenda. We don't, I said we don't really understand what's happening here. But I do under, feel that if we want to pursue this agenda of trying to achieve broader population level effects, we need to better understand what it is about public policies that change levels of violence in general. And there are a number of strategies one can think of. For instance, one strategy in Latin America that's very interesting, because sometimes in the same country you have one city that goes up, one city that goes down. What is it that makes these differences? Why does Sao Paulo had a decline and other places in the rule of Brazil did not have a decline? So we need to understand these differences 
and we need to understand whether they are in a systematic way related to public policy decisions. We can look at natural experiments. For instance, that was a study that I did with David Humphreys on the effects of uh, liberalization of licensing laws. So if you want to have a drink these days in the UK and you can still go to a bar at 12 o'clock in the night, that's because licensing laws were liberalized under Tony Blair and we tried to understand whether that changes levels of violence and it didn't. Um, so I want to go to a number of proposals. So now we're talking about the future. And the first proposal that I want to make uh, I, I should say here that I tried very hard to achieve the goal of making you know, specific policy recommendations. What should be done? But in the end, you end up with making these kind of like fuzzy statements. Uh, but I, I, I'll try to bring this down to um, something useful. So, so the first proposal is that if we want to achieve a sustained violence reduction this will require better governance and a movement towards inclusive civil societies. And just to make this case even stronger, my view would be that you can deliver as many individual level, whether it's parent training programs or social skills program as you like. If you don't achieve a state that functions reasonably well, that's not going to make a difference. That's, that, that's the view. And what I try to do here is to break this down into actual action. Um, so civil servants, there is states have the possibility to change the behavior of those people who are employed by the state. And some states do this and some states don't do this. There is now quite a good evidence on anti-corruption policies. So I'm going away from the homicide and I'm saying, well, we need to reform the state and we need to understand how states can be reformed. Um, effective policing comes into play, child protection services, uh, and so on. And of course, respect for human rights. And unless states respect human rights, I don't see any good reasons why homicide or violence amongst the citizens should go down. So, so let me just pursue one theme, legitimacy, which has become somewhat of a fashion topic, but I think very rightly so. And the background, of course, of why criminologists and some others, several others, became interested in the topic of legitimacy is the notion that violence is not just an issue of individual pathology. Violence has systemic features, influenced, for instance, by the benefit of violence, costs of violence, and beliefs about the benefits of cooperative behavior. And when it comes to this, we need to ask, well, what makes a social order legitimate? in the perspective of citizens. Because the idea is only if you think that the social order, the moral order, the way you know, your efforts are being rewarded or not rewarded, only if the social order is seen as legitimate and fair uh, will people comply with rules. So why do people comply with moral rules? I think uh, Tyler has done a fantastic job of saying, well, and for criminologists, it was really interesting saying, well, I want to understand why people comply with rules, moral rules, rather than saying, well, why do they break the rules? Um, and, and some of the things that we need to understand, for instance, and which is rarely done in conventional longitudinal studies of children, we need to understand moral socialization, but also legal socialization. At what age starts children, for instance, think about the legal background of their society and the reasons why it may make sense to comply with laws or not comply with laws? When do they start thinking about what the police is or what a criminal justice system is or what punishment means? And how does this change? And how is this influenced by their experiences with um, societies? And what systemic features of social systems? The school as an so example of a state. I think, tend to think I, I do quite a lot of research in schools, and whenever I ever go to schools, they're micro-states. They have authorities, they have rules, and they have problems with compliance, and they operate in a very similar way. And the legitimacy of the school, the legitimacy of the rules of a school, and whether it's seen as being enforced in a fair and consistent way, is a very important um, element of making a school work well. I want to show you this to you with one example. Um, we did, together with a PhD student of mine, 
uh, we were interested in the salience of some of the risk factors in Zurich and Montevideo. We did this, well, Nico is from Montevideo, but it's also quite nice that Uruguay is known in Latin America as the Switzerland of Latin America. So, so that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when you look at violence rates uh, in Montevideo and Zurich, they're roughly the same size. Montevideo is a little bit bigger. Homicide is about 15 times higher, and robbery is about five times higher. So there is certainly a problem there. So what we did was to do the school-based survey, the sampling and so on, the questionnaire was all identical. And we were interested in a number of risk factors, individual level risk factors, parenting, substance use, antisocial behavior generally, and routine activities, and so on. So what I show you is just on what, so, so when you want to make recommendations in a given society, one important indicator is, well, is there some risk factor that is particularly salient in this society that you should really think about addressing? So here is the result. And I found this interesting. So parents in Montevideo are no worse than parents in Zurich. Levels of self-control actually at Zurich kids were slightly lower on this scale. Uh, overall levels of antisocial behavior, conduct disorder, no difference whatsoever. Uh, overall substance abuse, no difference whatsoever. The main difference, and that was a big difference, was trust in the police the legitimacy of the police, that was huge. And that the difference is roughly about 25% of kids in Zurich say that they don't trust the police. About 75% of kids in Montevideo say that they don't trust the police. And that feeds into schools. There is also much lower trust in the fairness of teachers and the way the school is run. So I don't know what to make out of it. And my claim here is not that I have any firm evidence that this is causally responsible for the differences in homicide. There may be lots of other processes, but what I want to say here is that if we think about this in terms of prevention science, this is interesting, and it suggests that there is something about the fairness of social order that may be relevant, and certainly one of the recommendations in December to the authorities, school authorities in Montevideo will be there is a problem with the way young people perceive the social order that you have in your society, and you need to think about how, what to do about it. So the second proposal that I have is to say that any sustained violence reduction will rest on more intensive and effective formal and informal social control mechanisms. I don't want to go into these various examples. I, five minutes. Three. Three. Okay, three. Okay, okay I'll, I'll be quick. But I want to make a point about punishment because we had this discussion um, uh, this morning. And I want to look specifically at punishment for homicide in Honduras, which has, as we just saw, the highest level of homicide in the world. And first of all, I want to say I can't see any alternative to punishment. Um, there need to be some costs associated with doing harm to other people. Um, and, and if any one of you believes that the criminal justice system will go away in the next 30 years, we would have a very interesting discussion. If the state doesn't punish, and that's an interesting problem, if the state doesn't punish, somebody else will. So let me ask you, what is the average tariff for murder in Honduras? Now, I've, I've done, I don't know exactly what the answer is, and this was just an ad hoc Calculation. So the overall imprisonment rate in Honduras is about 160 people per 100,000, uh, according to Daniel Ortega, who probably is somewhere in the room. If you assume that 50% sit in prison for homicide, which is probably far too high, um, then this would mean about 80 per 100,000 sit in prison for homicide, which means that overall, the average expected duration of punishment for a homicide in Honduras is just one year which is quite cheap. And the question is, do we think this is morally right? Now, what drives this difference? This difference is not driven by the punitiveness of the criminal justice system. This difference is driven by the low clearance rate. Right? So what I include here, of course, is all the homicides that don't get, are not being cleared up. And the clearance rate in many Latin American countries is abysmally low. It's about 5 to 8%. Now, I'm... So, so one of the things that is important to say, and, and this is Dan Nagan. Dan Nagan knows, and, and if you are interested in punishment, I think that's an important part of the game. We need to think about how to make punishment work better. Because governments will ask this question. 
And one of the things that we now know is that there are a number of features that make the criminal justice system work uh, worse. In Honduras, it's slow. It takes several years until you're being uh, brought uh, to court. It's severe if you are actually being punished. It's unfair, and the punishment is rare. And what Dan Nagan says, and I think he's absolutely right, if a criminal justice system is going to work reasonably well, it needs to be deliver the punishment fast. Uh, and that, by the way, that also holds, for instance, for parental punishment. It needs to be lenient or moderate. It needs to be fair and needs to be certain. So I, I just find this interesting. When you look at the 5 to 7% conviction rates in Honduras these days, it's exactly the same. We have some good data on medieval England. It's exactly the same likelihood of being convicted in medieval England. So, so I, I find this quite interesting. Um, so let me go to the last one. Major decline in violence requires sub substantial efforts by coalitions of moral entrepreneurs against, that's us, to change moral beliefs and sensitivities. And David Finklor was quite right to say, this can't just be us thinking that we are morally right and all the others are morally wrong, and that we need to take into account that there are different views on, for instance, alcohol consumption and other behaviors that others may think are wrong in the West. But I want to just briefly, I, I, I think I have 30 seconds left, show you something about <laughs> um, what is morally right and why this is such a big problem. So the background is that moral neutralizations, that's something that I'm quite interested in, of harm doing, are powerful facilitators of violence, especially if they're supported by religious or political elites. And what we did in um, Amman was to ask, again, what was a school-based survey, is it okay to kill a wife, a daughter, a, uh, a sister, if she has dishonored the family? And is it okay for a husband to beat his wife if she's unfaithful, and so on and so forth? So these are the rates. In Amman, which is you know, relatively westernized, about 50% of boys say, well, it's right to kill the wife if she has dishonored the family. And astonishingly, 25% of girls. And amongst lower class kids, it's actually normative. It's the majority who think this is right. And when it comes to, uh, to uh, 15 year olds, whether they think that it's right for a husband to beat his wife, it's 87% of boys. And again, 78% of girls. So this is a strong normative incentive to actually do these things. And this brings down the topic that many of us have been talking about this morning, that changing norms, and, and you have it in your program, thinking about changing norms, getting elites on board, you know, engaging in this process of making the local elites, the national elites, own and share a vision that what kind of behaviors are morally wrong and to also stand for it. And I mention religious elites specifically because in the secular Western society we rarely think about this. But I think in many societies that's quite important. So I, I will end with just one graph. One of the things that I tried to do in this conference was to bring together people who look at violence more from a public health perspective, people who look from a justice, governance, cr criminal justice perspective, and people who look at it from a civil society perspective. And I think there is too little discussion going on between these groups. And I think what should happen is a stronger exchange of views and understandings of violence between these kind of approaches. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emmanuel. I think you, you have succeeded admirably through your presentation in justifying why we should do what is on this final chart and also utterly fascinating and very compelling presentation. The floor is open for observations, comments, reflections, questions. Okay, are we having the mics or do we just shout? Okay, and the next one would be Susan Bissell, and then at the back there, and then Peter Donnelly. So here, Mandy? Alex. Okay, and upstairs. All right, good. We've got four so far, please. Hello. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Hi, um, my name is Paul Simpson. I'm from PLOS Medicine. Something that I was thinking about while you were talking was 
and that hasn't been discussed in very much in, in the uh, talks that we're in here, is um, availability of weapons and specifically gun control to me seems like would be fit into there very nicely, but it isn't there. And often I've heard, I was talking about things around alcohol, for example. Yes, and you well, mentioned. They, they were. Sorry. Because a Alex was. Rush, well, no, you quite rightly. Uh, but there were. <laughs> and, and on the formal social control slide, um, th this is exactly where I think this needs to fit in. Of course, it's at the boundary between criminal justice, but I think this is exactly the kind of things control of, of, of firearms, control of alcohol, uh, for instance, actual control of, you know, in, in Western Europe, we have so many laws.